RX Television on RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit SpeciesNutrition.com. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. This is your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competitions, whatever's on your mind, it is all on the table. As we now go to Dave Palumbo. Dave, you look like the kind of a promoter you would see running up and down the Vegas Strip. <laughs> Tell us about the elaborate ensemble you have on. My uh, good friend Rob Swafford uh, sent me uh, this, the Mexican national shirt. It, it's great. I mean, this thing has got like all kinds of bling all over it. It's got the back is even better. I don't know if I can turn around here. I don't want to ruin my... It's, it's, just, it's just an awesome shirt, this thing. I had to wear it. I don't think I could wear it out. I think I'd be too embarrassed to wear it out, but it's, for TV, it's great. I feel like Bob Chicarillo a little bit, you know, those little suits he wears up when he MCs. It's, uh, I mean, the Mexicans know how to do it. They just, they just bling it out, and they're like, man, we're throwing a party. We want everyone there, and uh, that's really what the Nationals were. It was like, it was like a three-day you know, affair of just like nonstop you know, fun. And uh, So he was down there. He lives in Mexico now, and he sent me back this shirt, so I had, I had to wear it just to represent I also want to say another thing. My good friend, Mr. G, George Smalley, um, I've been talking about this for, for two years now. I think he finally is ready to put these on the shelf. Mr. Potts potato, Protein Potato Chips. They're actually, they're actually regular potato chips that have, um, they're Ruffles potato chips that actually have a protein coating on them. So all this different coatings, all the flavors, that's with the, um, the protein. It's 12 grams of protein per bag. And I love these things. I'm completely addicted to them. They decided to put them in this new white bag, which I think is a good idea because what happens is you can actually stand them up and they stand up on the counter by themselves. So they're kind of like a great promotional piece right there for themselves. And uh, these will be available soon in all stores and 7-Elevens and stuff like that. So Mr. G, congratulations. You got a great product here. Yeah, we're completely addicted to them. We fight over these in the office. Thank God Mr. G supplies us with plenty of these. And uh, my kids eat them, I eat them, my wife eats, everyone who's in the office, Tyler eats them. And they're, they're just delicious, and we can justify them because they got protein in them, right? So thank you, Mr. G. Of course, Mr. G of Heavy Muscle TV fame. Let's go to the questions. The first two questions on the show from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. First question, when taking anabolics, why wouldn't tapering up yield more gains over the period of time? We know we can only add muscle so fast, so if taking 500 mg of test a week lets me gain a couple of pounds a week, why would I ride that out until I hit a plateau and then add more tests or another anabolic? Well, having said that, why would you take, uh, you know, why would you take any more than 500 milligrams of tests? You know, it, it goes back to the old saying, when you first start, you don't eat a lot of stuff. At some point, you get to a threshold where you're like, you know what, I want to maximize my gains, okay, over the period of time. So if you're doing an 18-week cycle, and half that cycle you're doing 500 milligrams a week, you might be losing some gains that you might have been making had you been taking 1,000 milligrams a week. Now, having said that, if you do 2,000 or 3,000 milligrams a week, you're not necessarily going to get more gains at that point. You're just going to get a lot more side effects. So, you know, personally, I think that about 1,000 milligrams per week is, about, is ideal for muscle gains with the minimal amount of side effects. When you go over that, you tend to get more side effects. When you go below that, you don't get as much muscle growth. So that's why, you know, in, in people that are experienced users, that's usually the threshold amount that you'd want to do. You never want to go kind of less than that because once again, you're not going to maximize how much muscle you put on because you're only you're not on all the time. You're not on 365 days a year. You can't do that. You won't respond that that often. So when you are on, you want to maximize the ability or you maximize your ability to build muscle during that period of time. And if so, if you're not taking enough, you're cheating yourself in a sense. Second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. On a maintenance diet, is there any benefit to metabolism, tossing in a cheat meal, or a once-weekly higher day? So I guess the question is, cheat meal or cheat day on a maintenance diet? Um, I think you should always have a cheat meal. I think you should never eat the same thing all the time. Because your body stagnates. It plateaus. It understands what's going on. And then what happens is it stops making progress. So whether you're trying to lose weight or whether you're trying to gain weight. Now, if you're trying to maintain, I think you're just going to get stagnant in the sense that you're going to feel like, all right, I just don't feel, I, I'm losing the drive to go to the gym. Always give your brain and your body that extra something special, that meal where you can kind of let loose once a week. 
Think about it, if you're eating six times a day, seven days a week, that's 42 meals a week you're eating, okay? If one out of 42 meals is, is something a little junkier, okay, you're not setting yourself back anything. If anything, you're only making improvements to your physique and you're only gonna help spike your metabolism and shock your body into new growth, into new fat loss. So I think it's a good idea to have a cheat meal once a week. ATL Fantasy, are Quan Sleep's genetic? Also, have you ever seen someone put sight enhancement oil in the outer Quan Sleeps with good results? Um, I, I don't like to do in sight enhancement oils in the quads. Look, you always, almost 99% of the time, it's gonna look lumpy and fake, okay? Genetic sweep to your legs has a lot to do with the genetics, but it has a lot to do with building muscle. Everyone's quad shape is gonna be different depending on what your genetic potential is. So if, you, if I blow my legs up as big as they can get and the next guy does his, the shape will look completely different. You can't really influence that. However, you can influence how much muscle you put on your body, and that's what you have to work on. So whether you have your feet positioned this way or this way or this way or this way, you're probably not gonna change that much on the development that you're gonna get on your legs. However, if you open your stance up, you're gonna involve more adductor, the inner thighs, which is gonna girth and make a girthier quad. If you keep your, your, your feet closer together, you're gonna to really just target quads and kind of eliminate that inner thigh, which a lot of times gives the, the, the muscles, a, the, the leg muscles a smaller look because you don't have as much, you're missing out on a whole muscle group. So while foot position is not that important in or out, uh, width, you know, wide and close does make a big difference. So, you know, there is ways of influence, you know, how your legs look, but ultimately your genetic shape is your genetic shape. Excellent. 187. I've been training for nearly a decade now. I've competed. I've been ripped. I've been strong. I've had striations. I've been vascular, but I've never had my cephalic vein pop out. Is there any science or training method to bring out one cephalic vein? You're talking about the vein that goes right down the middle of the bicep. And you know yes. what? I had one of those from the day I started training, okay? My, my, it wasn't that big. As I got bigger and bigger, it got thicker and thicker and, and it looked more impressive, more impressive. So I always had veins, you know, I, I have them now and I'm, not, I'm only 190 pounds. So um, that's just my genetics, you know. Um, can you make them come out? Can you make them bigger? Yeah, through training. But genetically, if you don't really have them all the time, you'd probably, the only time you'll probably have them is like right before a show when you suck out all the water and you burn up all the subcutaneous fat. Um, if you tend to be vascular all the time, you'll get more vascular before a show. And that's just the way it is, you know. Some people have a lot of superficial veins and very low body fat and thin skin, like myself. Other people, you know, have thicker skin, but they put muscle on. They have more dense muscle on their body because that's just the way their bodies are wired. Once again, a lot of genetics. Couple of Olympia-related questions from PT Heavy 9 Is this the year that Flex Lewis gets dethroned and then Kirillos 98 Dave, can you get Phil Heath on this channel? Um, I, don't, I don't think that uh, Flex Lewis is going to lose unless we see Hadi Shupin somehow get a visa from uh, Iran, which we're in the process of working on right now. <laughs> I'm involved in this project. I don't know if it can happen, but we'll see. Um, can, uh, will we get Phil on the show? Um, that's in the works as well. Uh, obviously, as you guys know, Phil is no longer you know, exclusive to AMI and he's able to do interviews. Um, once again, if I do an interview, however, I wanna make sure it's gonna be something special and something that's unique, not like everyone else is gonna do. So it might not happen overnight and uh, we're in talks with him. So that, that's definitely on the pipeline. Sean, Willie, Dave, do you have any tips to help tighten up loose skin besides it naturally tightening up over time? You know, that's a question I get asked a lot and, 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 and it's a question I don't really like because I don't really have a, an answer for a lot of people. You know, people come to me and they show me this, they were 300 pounds and now they're 180 pounds and they got this loose skin hanging on their lower stomach. What can they do to tighten it up? A lot of times there's nothing you can do. But then there's a lot of times where I see spontaneously people lose weight and they keep it off for six, eight months and the skin tightens up. So I don't, I don't ever like to say it's impossible, but it's unlikely if you have that loose, like saggy skin there or that it's almost overstretched a lot of times it doesn't come back. Look, I have on my, on my back of my arms, I have loose skin um, just from being, you know, having 24 inch arms and now I have, you know, whatever, 16 inch arms or 15 inch or whatever they are, I don't measure them. Um, you know, it's just the skin was stretched out tremendously when I was huge, you know, and, and so I have loose skin. I have no body fat, but I have some skin there. It's not hanging, you know, you know uh, terribly, but it's still there and it's, it's bothersome. 
you know, if I was uh, if I was going to walk around with a shirt off, I wouldn't like it. But hey, that's what happens. You know, it's better to be 180 pounds in shape and lean with a little loose skin than being a fat slob with no loose skin, right? I mean, let's face it. That that's the bottom. Uh, that's the bottom line. Now, for a lot of women who come to me and they say, "Hey, I loose skin on the back of my arms. I don't know what to do." On my butt, it's loose. I don't really, I, I kind of, I'm in shape and they show me pictures and they are in shape. I'm like, you gotta build more muscle there. The muscle will stretch that skin tight and, and that's really the only solution. Now, if it's on your lower abdomen, unfortunately, most of the time, the solution is to get a tummy tuck, you know, tummy, you know, skin reduction there. The top roller wants to know if being on an anti-estrogen and finasteride would make a dose of testosterone more anabolic than if taken alone since less of it converts. Well, if you have less testosterone converting to estrogen and DHT, you have more available to build muscle. So that's just logical. If you block estrogen production, you block DHT production, you can have more testosterone available. So that, you know, that, there's nothing really too shocking there. Um, however, having less testosterone and less DHT doesn't mean you'll build muscle better, okay? It'll mean you'll be able to build muscle better if you have more testosterone about, uh, around. It doesn't mean, in other words, they don't, estrogen doesn't stop muscle building. And as a matter of fact, People have a lot of estrogen build muscle better usually because estrogen sensitizes androgen receptors to a certain degree. I think that's why women can take, le to take lower doses of drugs and they can grow better. I think because they have so much estrogen in their body, they actually have better androgen sensitivity. Not to mention their androgen re receptors are better just to begin with because they don't have a lot of testosterone in the body. They don't produce any. They have very minute amounts coming from adrenal androgens like DHEA. And so they have to be able to be responsive to that. So women have a, a, a double bonus on building muscle quickly. That's why when I see women taking ridiculous amounts of drugs, anabolics, that, that have tons of side effects, it, I, I, I cringe because there's no reason for them to use that. A little Anivar, you know, and, and they can put a lot of muscle on with that. Brooks Clark, Dave, have you ever refused to coach a client for a show because of extremely unhealthy blood work? No, because I always see it as a challenge to fix the blood work. If I get someone with unhealthy blood work, I want to get them to, to have improved blood work. And a lot of times, just putting them on like macadamia oil, fibrolyze, omega lyse, these, you know, like a liver, you know, like liver stable from molecular nutrition, uh, kidney stuff. Once I get them on this, I clean up their organs, we clean up their blood, you know, and, and they're doing terrific in, in one to two months. And a lot of times their doctors will be, and then they lose weight on top of that because they're on a diet with me. The doctor's like, I don't know what you're doing. Whatever you're doing, don't stop. I've had so many people tell me that. And a lot of time it's, it's just because I'm getting their diet cleaned up and I'm getting them to lose weight. But then you put those essential fatty acids and are very important. Fiber, very important, pulling toxins and, and lowering LDL cholesterol. You can't believe just on a couple of supplements and a little few diet changes how radically you can change the blood work around. Moving to two, 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 advice on holding on to leg size with age. You know what the key is? Don't stop training them. You know, as soon as you stop and you lose the muscle, it's hard to get it back. Obviously, I had the quads hair and I, and I was out of the gym a lot. And I, have, I, I still can't train legs well because I have this, the quad is still partially torn. I'm going to need to have another surgery probably in the next year or two whenever I have free time. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, so... I lost a lot of leg mass, and I, I don't know if it would come back if I, if I trained it, you know. But I think for the guys who never lost the mass to begin with, they seem to be able to hold it. You know, we, I, talking about Dexter Jackson being the ageless wonder, he never lost any leg size. He never really had huge legs to begin with, but he has good legs, and it, he never lost the leg mass, and so he's, he's able to maintain it because he's still able to train, he has no injuries, and that's the key. If he would have stopped training for two years and just kind of like do nothing for his legs and they shrunk up, and then he went to try to put that size back on, he'd have, a, he'd have a difficult time. And that's just the way it is. So the key is, don't if you don't want to lose legs, don't stop training your legs. Tyron, Ram, Dave, can you tell us about your arrhythmia you said you had during exercise? What does it feel like? The, the, the weird thing is it doesn't feel like anything. I don't even know I have it. The only reason I knew I had it was because I was wearing a heart rate monitor when I would ride my bike. You know, you put those straps around your chest and you have a little readout on your, well, actually I have a, a little Garmin readout on my bike. And I was seeing, I was looking at these high numbers. I'm like, this is impossible. I feel fine. So I went to the doctor and got it checked and they thought it was, they thought it was a mistake too. And then they tested me and they're like, no, you're, you're really, you're throwing these crazy rhythms. So, you know, 
to, to play it safe, obviously, I, I don't want to, you know, have a heart attack or something like that. Now, like I said, I've never had an episode where I actually felt it, but I don't want to get to that point. That's how people drop dead suddenly on basketball courts or you know, on soccer fields out of nowhere. And so that's why I addressed it aggressively. And I think you got to do that. You got you got to know what's wrong with you and what's right about you, and so that you don't get surprised because people die because they get surprised because they're not ready for it. Uh, if you're ready for or you you're, you have a contingency plan, if something happens then you could, you could get through the, the, in, the incidents, you know. Uh, I, don't, I try not to do super high intensity exercise anymore if I can help it. That doesn't mean I can't run up a flight of steps. It means that I can't, I can't go bike riding for an hour straight, you know, pushing maximum, you know, RPMs. It's not smart and it doesn't serve any purpose because I'm not preparing for the, you know, Tour de France anytime soon. So <laughs> know your own limitations and it doesn't mean that you should live in fear of them. It just means that you should just be aware of them. Watching Ask Dave on RxMuscle.com, brought to you by Species Nutritional. Let's go to Carlston Iron Burner. Dave, what's the best way to build a nice tricep head? You know, I always found, at least in my body, because I have very long arms, that using isolating one unilateral movements with cables work the best. And, and you know, I really learned that from, from Vince Taylor. Vince Taylor always said that, you know, you don't have to go crazy super heavy with compound movements for arms because they... They respond to isolation type movements. So, you know, if I do reverse grip pull downs, if I do one arm push downs, if I do overhead cable extensions, um, I guess I could do that. That's my new shoulder. It doesn't hurt. Overhead cable extensions, even some kickbacks, you know, that's going to really isolate my, mu my muscle, my tricep heads, and I can go heavy on those. And that's going to build muscle. And I found that that was the best way, to, probably the second half of my career, I built my arms using these techniques. Heavy weights, isolating movements, unilateral, one arm at a time. And my, I had good arms. I had, you know, I, I, when I started out, my father used, used to say to me, he goes, you're never going to be a good bodybuilder. You just don't have the arms of these guys. And I'm like, it, it would drive me crazy because I knew he was right. And it took me a while, but you know, I built 24-inch arms. So anyone can do it. If you, if you put your mind to it and you eat enough food and use the right training techniques, you can add muscle to your body. Let's go to Jacoby Alb or Alvi. Dave, how does omega fats bring down inflammation? And is something like omega lines comparable to kidney stuff in terms of inflammation reduction? Yeah, ki kidney stuff is special because it reduces inflammation around the kidney tubules. And that's by, by reducing the inflammation and allowing these tub tubules to dilate more, you can get better filtration at the kidney tubule, which means you're going to get lower creatinine and BUN levels, which is what we want meaning the, the blood is being filtered more efficiently, right? I mean, that, that's, that's what we're looking for. Uh, but the omega-3 fats, you know, specifically DHA, EPA, which are the omega-3 intermediates, actually reduce total body inflammation. There's actually another um, fatty acid in omega lyse called palmitoleic acid. It's an omega-7 fat. It's not essential, but it's, it's also a terrific uh, reducer of, of total body inflammation. And obviously, when body inflammation is lower, the incidence of heart disease and any kind of like uh, cancers and, and, and chronic uh, degenerative diseases decreases. So these omega fats, by their nature, the omega 3s, just reduce inflammation. Now it's interesting, the omega 6 fats that we actually put in omega lyse, specifically coming from primrose oil, gamma linoleic acid, GLA, also is, is probably one of the only omega 6 fats that's anti inflammatory as well. So we only put the anti inflammatory fats in omega lyse so that it's heart healthy. And you know, you're getting the, the fatty acids that are very hard to get from the diet. And that's the key. Because you're not going to get these essential fats from your diet, you could be deficient in them. So rather than be deficient in them, I created it like an insurance policy type fatty acid supplement. You take that every day and you don't have to worry if you're getting the right amount of certain types of fats in your diet, as long as you're getting the fats in. And that's the key. That's why I like to really focus on, on diet-wise on the monounsaturated fats, which are not essential, but they're heart healthy, uh, like macadamia and other oil olive oil if you can find real olive oil, even avocado oil. Those should be, you know, the, the predominance of a lot of your fats in your diet. And then the supplemental form should come from your omega threes and sixes. Another Olympia related question from Tony Malzahn. Do you see anyone new cracking the top six in the open class this year? If so, who gets bounced out? I'll give you the top six from last year. Phil, Big Rami, Bonac, Dexter, Roden, and Roley. I don't. I don't think that Mike. I don't think we're going to see anyone else in that top six that's going to really shake up anything. I think you'll see in the two twelve. You're going to see some new talent in there. But I. I don't know. I just don't think there's anyone. You know, maybe Nathan the Asher could sneak in there. But then again, who do you throw out of that top six? 
that's that's the question. You know, um, if Kai Green would enter the show, I think that, that he would be certainly in the top six, and someone would get booted out of there. I think Ruley's going to move up. If anyone was going to get kicked out of that top six, it might be like a Rodin, you know, because you know he's had some health issues earlier this year. Although I hear he's looking really good, and he's at the his best ever. So I don't, I don't think I think we're going to see the same top six this year. Uh, Kasim L. Sentry, Arimidex, is it a must during cycle? Does it help with libido? Can someone off cycle use it? Well, you know, Arimidex blocks the conversion of testosterone into estrogen. Um, if, you're a, if you're a person that aromatizes testosterone real easily, meaning you convert a lot of testosterone into estrogen, Arimidex is an absolute must then. And you know who you are. You know, you know when you're estrogenic, you hold water, your nipples are sensitive. You, have, uh, you, you, you're, you hold body fat in your lower body like a woman would, and that's an estrogenic person. That's a person who absolutely needs, you know, Arimidex. When I was on hormone replacement, I never took Arimidex because I just didn't need it. I didn't, I didn't aromatize that much in my body, and I think it's because my body fat levels were really low. So you have to figure out what your genetics are. Now, if you do take some Arimidex and you lower your estrogen, you're going to suppress your natural testosterone much less because it's estrogen that suppresses the pituitary from releasing LH and FSH, which stimulates testosterone production. So if you don't have any estrogen around, you're not going to shut off that, that feedback loop and you're going to produce more natural testosterone. So once again, you know, you got to go by what are your genetics and, and, and are you estrogenic and not, you know, do you need it or don't you need it? Stolen Duck 2 with a question on Colum Von Moger. Based on your experience, will Colum Von Moger be able to squat beyond 315 again or better yet, Bring his quads to the, the the development he once had. You know, I thought I was going to be able to. I was actually squatting 225, you know, and for easy reps. And I thought I was going to go back to 315, although I wasn't ready to push it at that point. But you know what? My quad just didn't hold up and, 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 and let go. Now, he's a younger guy, so he should heal fine. Uh, he should recover from this surgery as long as he doesn't try to repel off the side of a freaking pyramid or something like that in e Egypt or something like that. He should recover and he should be able to lift again. And he should be able to develop. Branch Warren did, but Branch Warren wasn't doing crazy stunts either after after you know his surgery. So who knows? You know, uh, I'd like to see him get back. I like his physique. I think he's got a good personality. I'd love to interview him. You know, one of these days. And I think that he's a he's a real talent. But I think he's his own worst enemy right now. TJ O'Connor, the vacuum pose has been a super popular, has become a super popular pose once again in bodybuilding and especially with the classic physique division. My waist has always been small, but I can't seem to create that sucked in look. What are some techniques to help hit this pose effectively? And then shout out Shanique Grant uh, responding below on that question as well. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, almost, I love the vacuum pose. I do. I think, and, and I think I liked it because no one was hitting it. Now that everyone's doing it, it's kind of making me a little, I'm kind of getting a little bored with it, to be honest with you. Not everyone should hit the vacuum pose, okay? Because not everyone looks good in the vacuum pose. Some physiques don't look that good. It's just weird looking on them. So, you know, if you have a real deep rib box like Arnold did, you know, that vacuum or Zane, that vacuum looks great. But on a lot of guys, it doesn't look great. So you got to determine what works for your physique. Don't try to be someone else. Don't try to hit a vacuum just because you think that's a classic pose that you have to hit. It, it's silly to do that. Only use it if it works to your advantage on stage. And you know, you can look at pictures and you can say, hey, that looks good or, or it doesn't. And if you're not sure, ask someone else that you know is going to tell them the truth. I'll tell you the truth <laughs> if your vacuum pose looks good. Now, what was the other part of the question, Sid? No, that, that was the question. Oh, I thought there was, there was another piece to it. Um, no, no, no. I said shout out to Shanique Grant because she... Uh, respond oh, no, how to get, oh, no, they, the, the part of the question was how do you get a, do a vacuum pose? Now, if you're having trouble hitting the pose, you can do these intestinal exercises, breathing exercises that I've talked about uh, in other videos where you kind of just put your hands on your stomach, you, you suck in, you push out. You suck in, you push out. You do 300 of those a day. That's working that transverse abdominus muscle. That's the inner layer of muscle under the rectus abdominus. Though that layer of muscle is responsible for pulling in your stomach. That's what you're doing Okay, on a vacuum pose, you're pulling in your stomach and then throwing your arms up so that you're hitting that vacuum. So you're blowing your air out and sucking your stomach in at the same time. But if you don't have strong transverse abdominus muscles, you're not going to be able to pull your stomach in that much. That's why you got to start doing these intestinal breathing exercises once again, in, out, 
It's, it's, it feels unnatural to push out, but you push out, you push, pull in. You push out, you pull in. And you do that 300 times a day, within, I promise you, within a month or two, you're gonna see a complete difference in the way for you execute that vacuum pose. Tower 84, how to train and eat right with an active chronic ulcerative colitis. You, you gotta be careful, you gotta, you gotta find what works for you. The food, you know, you're gonna figure out which foods your body tolerates, which ones it doesn't. Um, a great supplement is uh, by standard process is, is Boswellia complex. It's got a very strong extract of Boswellia with a couple other anti-inflammatory herbs in there. You take that, it seems to calm down the colitis tremendously. Once again, you know, you gotta be able to eat. You, you can't become a victim of your colitis. You know, you have to f find a way to get it done get those meals in, eat clean, you know, try to stay away from, you know, irritating foods, okay? Try to take a probiotic, you know, whether it be like a bubby sauerkraut, you know, a couple, a couple servings every day. These are things you've got to do. You, gotta, you, have, you have restrictions on yourself when you have ulcerative colitis. But if you live by those restrictions, do you know what irritates it and makes it worse and what makes it better? Then you can control the disease. Muhammad Jamal, would you please talk about sugar alcohols and sugar substitutes uh, like stevia and the difference between them? How are they calorie free yet taste so sweet? Well, you know, there's different sweeteners. There's, there's aspartame, which has been around forever, which is just two amino acids, phenylalanine and aspartic acid. You mix them together and they taste sweet. I don't know why people get so crazy about aspartame and think it's, it's going to cause everything from cancer and death to all these autism and all these terrible things. I don't agree with you, okay? Two amino acids mixed together can't be that bad for you, okay? Now, if you eat anything in an excessive amount, you're gonna get side effects. So that being said, don't overdo it. Now, Splendor is like the new, is like the new generation of, of, of like equal, okay? Because what Splendor is, it's, the suc it's sucralose. It, it looks like a sucrose with a table sugar molecule, but they, they've altered it chemically, so your body doesn't recognize it, okay? And so you just don't absorb it. But it tastes, it's actually 10 times or more, maybe more, sweeter than regular sugar. So that, and you can cook with it. It has a good, good uh, texture to it. So here's something you can certainly use. Now, um, stevia is something that all the naturalistic, the naturalists, I, I like to call them, started using. Oh, we can't use artificial sweeteners. We only can use things from nature, okay? As if amino acids are not from nature, whatever. Okay, so stevia actually is an herb that, that, that you find in the, in, you know, grown wildly that actually tastes sweet. And the problem is it's got a slight bitter taste to it. So you have to really kind of blend it. Usually it's mixed with, a, with um, some kind of other sweetener, artificial sweetener, to kind of, you know, even it off and allow it to be, you know, consumed without having that super bitter taste. I happen to like it a lot. Um, if the right type. Stevia balance to me is the best one because it's stevia mixed with inulin fiber which is unabsorbable source of fiber. And I, and I, and I see, tend to, to, to have people get really good results of that. Stevia balance, you can eat unlimited amounts while you're dieting, you have to worry about it. The problem with the Splendor and Equal packets is they add a, 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 a gram of dextrose or a gram of, um, um, usually, it's usually dextrose that they do put in there. Um, although I've seen maltodextrin. They're all, it's basically sugar. But it's only one gram per packet. But most people eat, you know, five to, 10, five to 20 packets a day. So that's not a good idea to do. So when you're dieting for a show, stick with the stevia balance. Off season, if you want to take in a couple packets of, uh, of sucrose, not a big deal. Like I said, I, I put it in my, in my decaf coffee every morning. Um, I know people that add it to their shakes, you know, to make it a little sweeter. There's nothing wrong with that. Hold on, hold on, sorry, oh. Sid. I just yeah. want to bring up sugar alcohols. The sugar alcohols that, they, that we used to use back in the day would give you crazy diarrhea, malabsorption. They were terrible. The new ones today, like you know, erythritol, they're, they're sugar alcohols, but they kind of don't really you know, mess with blood sugar that much. But remember, guys, there's no such thing as a free calorie. Every carb counts. The only carbs you don't have to count would be your fibrous carbs. But sugar alcohols are still caloric. They're not sugar, but they're caloric. Time for a couple of more questions. Panos, Dave, I've heard that when you use synthetic HGH in the morning, you must not eat carbs the first meal, but fats. Is that true? Does the release of insulin make any negative effects on your synthetic HGH? And what's your opinion about the best time to take your HGH during the day? Yeah, I like to take uh, growth hormone in the morning because you're the most catabolic in the morning, meaning you have the most catabolic hormones coming from cortisol early in the morning. And then as the day goes on, cortisol drops and your, your, your natural androgen hormones go up, your anabolic hormones. So 
you might as well take growth hormone in the morning when you're the most catabolic to try to counteract some of that, right? Because then you're going to grow better. Okay. The problem is that um, you know uh, a lot of people. I'm just trying to think. What was the original question? <laughs> they I have to go back. To uh, wow, I'm kind of blanking on that as well. Um, oh yeah, it was a long question um, about the, the best time to take. Oh, each, uh, about the best time. Yeah, to take I, growth. I, rem I remember what I was going to say. Oh, about having carbs. Yes, at your first yes. meal. So it, when you're that, taking right. growth hormone, because it's actually growth hormone already, and you're not worrying about your body producing its own, you can eat whatever you want. Because no matter what you eat, you could eat a gallon of ice cream. It doesn't matter how much sugar is in that ice cream because if you inject GH, you got GH in your bloodstream. Now, if you're trying to stimulate your body to produce its own growth hormone and you're eating a high carb diet, high sugar content, okay, that could suppress your natural GH release. But we're not trying to get our bodies to release GH. We're actually taking synthetic GH. So it doesn't matter what the environment is that you put it in. If you're taking synthetic GH, you got the GH in your body and it's going to act like GH. And that's the bottom line. You know, but if you're taking something that stimulates growth hormone release from the pituitary gland, now you have to look at what's the environment around it because maybe you won't actually release as much GH as you thought given the stimulus that you're giving your body. Make sense? I think it should. <laughs> Sarush SRD, can you explain sodium loading? I'm not a big sodium loader. I, I believe in sodium loading the whole diet, meaning that never cut your sodium. Eat whatever salt you want. As a matter of fact, salt your foods. The more sodium you consume, the less sodium sensitive you become. How do you become sodium sensitive? Well, if you don't eat a lot of salt in your diet, what happens is your body gets, senses low sodium. So it sends out a signal to release the hormone aldosterone from the adrenal glands. Aldosterone's job is to reabsorb sodium in water. So eating salt will actually make you more salt sensitive because the longer you go without salt, okay, your body starts to release an end, uh, a hormone known as aldosterone. Aldosterone's job is to reabsorb sodium in water. So if you're eating no salt, you're going to have high aldosterone. Every time you do eat salt, you'll retain it. If you're eating a lot, enough salt in your diet already, your aldosterone production will never go up, okay, because your body doesn't need it. So when you do eat a big salty crazy meal, you won't absorb that whole meal. You'll actually pee out everything and get rid of it because you don't have super high aldosterone. So the biggest mistake people make is, is, is somehow is restricting salt in their diet, thinking it's going to get them leaner, and it's not. Prime time, what's the idea behind having your feet elevated while waiting backstage for a show? Well, the problem is when you're backstage, okay, if you're on your feet, all the fluid that's left in your body can, will pool in your legs and you'll get swollen ankles and a lot of times your legs can smooth out a little bit. By laying down and elevating your feet, you're allowing the blood to come back to the heart and get recirculated you know, efficiently without that blood leaving okay, the, the circulatory system and, the, and what happens is the blood's not really leaving, it's the actual clear fluid portion of the blood, the water part of the blood that was leaving and going under the skin and is going to create more subcutaneous water. Okay, we don't want that. One more question is from Aisha M. Fate, and it's a question that we used to have a lot on the first few episodes of Iron Debate. Some say bodybuilding is not a real, quote, sport. Your take. You know, you go into the gym, you're working out. It's a physical endeavor. Um, it requires proper nutrition. It requires sleep, right? It requires the use of possibly performance-enhancing drugs. That, to me, is a sport. Now... Bodybuilding is a sport, but bodybuilding competition is judged like a pageant, like almost like a beauty pageant. Um, there, yeah, there are certain guidelines that you want to look for in muscle size and, and conditioning and stuff like that, but ultimately, the judges pick who they like, what, what the overall look is that they're, that they're attracted to, that that's like, hey, that's what I think bodybuilding should be about. So there's real no in-stone rules. You can kind of vote for whoever you want as a judge, and so that makes it a pageant in a sense. So it's a sport in the gym. When you compete, it's a pageant. Don't get upset when you don't get the placing you want because you think you deserve it. That doesn't mean that everyone else agrees with the, your opinion of the way you look. Some people may say, you know what, he looks good, but he doesn't look, I don't think that's not a look that's appealing to me. So that's why people get frustrated. And you, don't have, you can't get frustrated. It is what it is. That's the way it goes. It's not a subjective sport. It, it's an opinionated sport. And the judges get to decide who they like and who they want in that winner circle.
that is going to do it for this episode of Ask Dave. Again, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit speciesnutrition.com. For Dave Palumbo and our producer, Tyler Shore, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.